very fortunate indeed, given our current timing, to have Constanza with us today um, to talk about the meaning of the Trump era for Europe and Germany, uh, particularly this week when we know that the American president will be in Brussels next week, is I think particularly important and nobody is better equipped to talk about it than, than she is. She's an expert on German, European and transatlantic foreign and security policy and strategy and she's the inaugural Robert Bosch Senior Fellow on the Centre for the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institute. So she'll talk for about 25 minutes and then we'll, we'll open the floor because I think particularly in a group like this it's good to have as much discussion as we can. Um, when I joined Brookings two and a half years ago, uh, they recruited me as a Germany explainer, which I'm not really. I'm a, I'm a foreign and security policy generalist. I'm interested in strategy and all sorts of things. And, and I said at the time, you have to understand that I cannot explain Germany to you uh, if I don't go to the rest of Europe very regularly. There is no way of appropriately explaining the conditions and limitations on what Germany thinks it might be doing or can't do uh, without going to the rest of Europe. And um, Ireland is, I just didn't manage to get here, so I'm profoundly grateful, and I hope it won't be the last time. At least I will endeavor to perform in such a way that it won't be. Um, perhaps a word about myself, of my background. I'm a, a German, uh, but I grew up uh, as a foreign service brat, um, so uh, across Europe and the, the world, including America. So I've got, um, I lived there as a child, went to graduate school there, and I'm now living there again and worked for an American think tank, the German Marshall Fund, before I joined Brookings. And between that, I studied law and became a journalist, and I was a defense and security expert, uh, editor for, for Die Zeit, if that rings a bell for any of you, weekly paper in, uh, in Hamburg. So I, I tend to have less of a sort of uh, academic take on things and more of a sort of practical observers. But with that, let me, let, me, let me try and outline where I think we are on Trump and, and his consequences for Europe and Germany. And of course, the, the caveat that I immediately have to apply is that whatever I say now may be overwhelmed by events within the next 30 minutes, actually. <laughs> and so, you know, you might as well, you know, go out and have coffee. But um, uh, I, will, I will endeavor to give you sort of what I think is, 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 the, is the bottom line, and, and then maybe we can discuss some, some details. Um, and I think I, my, my, I will tr endeavor to sort of cut through the daily scandals, tweets and revelations and uh, look at the fundamentals of what's going on here um, and, how, and how those inform our own situation. And I'm going to ruthlessly um, crib from Ed Luce of the Financial Times with whom I was on a panel yesterday uh, in another European town. Um, who described th uh, Trump as a three-phase phenomenon so far. Uh, the th first 30 or 40 days, which was all America first, uh, an America first that was introduced to us, an, or a theory, uh, a doctrine that was intru introduced to us in one of the most unusual, if not the most unusual, of presidential inaugural speeches, um, a speech which has become known as the American carnage speech, um, and which painted a picture of an America that is miserable, a dystopian that is overcommitted abroad and taken advantage of by its allies, um, that is, um, not to put too fine a point upon it, screwed um, by its trading partners, that is, loses out from the international liberal order it has worked so long to protect, um, and that is, um, is better off having a friendly relationship with strong men around the world. Um, the other thing for which the speech and indeed other pronouncements of the new president were notable was their anger. Anger has, is making an hostility, or making a comeback in American discourse in a way that I find quite concerning. Um, I suppose you can say that a certain degree of political cor correctness needed to be uh, corrected, um, but frankly this is an overcorrection. <sighs> After this very disturbing first phase came what you could call the normalizing phase. Yeah where adults were hired to run the Defense Department, the Foreign Ministry, the National Security Council, or at least certain, certain dossiers in national security, and ambassadors around Washington were heard to be breathing big sighs of relief. And then we've had the 
the hundredth day and the events around that, and it seems like a roller coaster ever since then, really. Um, there has been an extraordinary acceleration of revelations and events, culminating, of course, in yesterday's appointment of a special counsel in the form of Robert Miller, former FBI chief. And um, these, the, these events have, I think, revealed that it's the same Trump, you know, despite the normalizing tendencies. Um, and I think the more important point is that it's, this is, Trump isn't just Trump. He is the symptom, I think, of larger, more fundamental divisions in American politics. Things that are a more entrenched polarization, um, structural changes in American politics that I think would require more than an election or, or much less a midterm to overcome. <coughs> Now let me talk about European reactions. Um, and I think the best way to do that is by, by perhaps qu quickly referencing the transatlantic status quo ante. And I've been in this business of watching the transatlantic relationship for the last 20 years as a journalist and as a think tanker at the German Marshall Fund and now at Brookings. So I, I, I can, if necessary, give you chapter and verse, but I'm, I'm going to editorialize. And um, I'm going to refer to my notes here, um, just to, to make sure I don't get this, I, I don't mess this up, because I got up at four o'clock in the morning in Zurich, and I'm mildly jet-lagged, but um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. So the transatlantic status quo ante was one in which, particularly in the Obama administration, I think we had every reason to think that we were America's partners of first choice. We were part of an extended tribe on both sides of the Atlantic, we had very genuine disagreements, but there was always the safety net of extended political, economic, trade, and social ties. Um, there was always a more special relationship than others. That was the relationship with the UK. But increasingly, my own country, Germany, slid into that role as the Brexit campaign took up speed in Britain and as Obama's relationship with Merkel turned from frosty to friendly. And of course, Washington had changed its mind about the EU fairly early on. People, I think, sometimes think that this happened only under Obama. I can assure you that it happened in the second term of Bush, uh, when uh, Washington started taking the EU seriously as an actor that needed to be recognized in its own right, invested a great deal in the American embassy at the, at the EU, etc. So the message was generally, we expect you to bear a greater share of the burden. Um, we, will, uh, we want you to provide more support in guarding the international liberal order. And in return, we're willing to cut you uh, more slack on certain things where we're, we'll give you greater autonomy, say, on certain aspects of European defense and security. And we'll even let you take the lead on some things, such the, the Minsk process being, being the best example of this. So what you had was a transatlantic relationship that had become perhaps a little cooler, a little more transactional, but at the same time, extremely broad. And I think the moment when we realized that it had changed in, in a rather profound way, it was something that you probably are not gonna expect me to say now, um, and that was the transatlantic, the, sorry, the global financial crisis. Um, it was the global financial crisis, more than any security or political crisis, or the NSA affair with Germany, that proved to policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic, how deeply integrated their economic spaces were. They introduced us to the, uh, to the phenomenon of contagion and forced us to understand that events in our own economic spaces could have a massive impact on the other side of the Atlantic. And so that we were joined at the hip, not just in the security sense, not just in the NATO framework, but in terms of economic integration as well. I think that was when it really hit home on many policymakers that we are, that the relationship had changed in a profound way. And, and I say this for, for two reasons. Um, one, because this has obvious security implications. And secondly, because I think that one of the, one of the ways in which Obama and Merkel, I think, understood each other was in their assumption that globalization and integration um, were both a source of opportunity and of tremendous risk in the transatlantic relationship. 
um, opportunity because they add new layers of you know, connectivity, potential innovation and growth, risk because they increase mutual exposure and vulnerability in the way I've just described. And, and again, this is something in which Obama and Merkel particularly understood each other and where they were separate from, say, Putin or, or Cameron or, or, or others, is, is the understanding that globalization and integration change the nature of power and of sovereignty because they reduce the ability of states to control data, people, territory. And that that has consequences for the way that international relations and politics are conducted. And I think the, the insight that, that Obama and Merkel both shared was that this requires a sort of less decisionist and less control fixated kinds of politics, and instead a politics that is more flexible and more focused on risk management. The reason that I'm painting you this broad picture is that I want to, want to give you a backdrop for what's happening now and why what's happening now is both so, seems retrogressive and, and in some ways, you know, divorced from the reality that, that I think one sees on the continent. And I'd be very surprised if you didn't actually see things quite similarly here in Ireland. Now, the one thing that also was, that also happened in this time was of course that all the politicians, all the policymakers in the, in the transatlantic relationship in the West were forced by a succession of crises to be in permanent crisis mode. And I think they overlooked the fundamental sort of tectonic changes in the, in the politics and the economics and the societies of their own nation states. I think they failed to see the things that were happening there. In particular, they failed, they failed to see that there were people who felt that they were excluded from the benefits of globalization and who were developing their own very insular, very walled off political subculture and a great deal of anger, which then ex ex exploded in this populist wave and made them very vulnerable to exploitation by external actors, whether it's Russian propaganda or IS terrorism. Now, let me come to, to European reactions to what's happening now. Um, after having described this backdrop. Now, I think there is almost no European in Europe or European in Washington who was accurately predicted the outcome of the November 8 elections in Washington. I think all of us are guilty of not having to want to, want, want to see it, or as they say in German, was nicht sein darf, das nicht sein kann. In other words, that which is not allowed to be can't be. Um, and arguably, we're still scrambling now to understand the full implications of these events. I mean, we're still only you know, a little more than 100 days into this. Um, the exception being, of course, those in Europe um, who themselves sort of share sympathies with Trump's voters and who see themselves as disruptors and as opponents of what they think of as a globalist establishment. So what are we, how, how, do we, how do we read what's going on? Uh, as I, I mentioned the ambassadors who breathed a sigh of relief at, at the signs of, of normalization. And I think that that is one of the theories of, of what is happening in Washington. The adults have taken over important beats, important dossiers. Um, they are containing the president's impulsive tendencies. They're um, hedging him around with sanity. Um, and I think we've actually seen in the last seven days or so that that only goes so far. And, and I think it's accurate to say that people in Washington are kind of dreading the big trip, <laughs> the trip to, which is going to take the president, I think at the end of, uh, in, in, within a week, no? Yeah, is it? yeah, Friday, a, yeah, uh, yeah. the weekend is going. On the exactly, on the weekend, he's going to, let me see, it's Israel, the Vatican, Sorry. Saudi Arabia, and Brussels. Mm. You know, just one of those could be, could, could be interesting, but the combination of the four of them, I think is, is, is possible, that, that could be quite exciting. But the, I mean, even in this sort of best, best case analysis, you know, there, are, there are elements of sanity and they will hold the system together. There was always the recognition in, in European capitals and among European analysts and diplomats in Washington that even in this best case scenario, you were going to have an enormous increase of volatility of unpredictability, of what you, you know, of, of the risk, the opportunity for strategic miscalculation, just erroneous interpretation of actions 
sayings, press releases, or tweets by other actors. So that's the first school. The second school is what I would call the normal is over school. And the normal is over school very simply says, um, look, you have to look at the fact that this administration is composed of very different sets of people, and you are going to be fooling yourselves if you don't look very hard and very clearly at the ideologues in this administration, and if you don't read what they've written, and if you don't listen to what they say. And they would argue that while in the first 100, 100 days, the institutions of, um, the, in other words, the checks and balances of the system have worked. Yeah? The courts have done what they're supposed to do. The executive has done what it's supposed to do. And to some degree, Congress has done what it's done, supposed to do. And civil society has been demonstrating. But, they, but the advocates of the normal is over school, to which you will have guessed by now, I belong as well, would also argue that institutions and civil society can be co-opted, bullied, and exhausted. And I think we're seeing signs of that already. The passing of the healthcare law is an instance of that. Um, and I think I can, I could probably name, name, name a couple more. It's also, I think, worth noting that the Republicans so far have shown very little inclination to, to look at what is a unique, in fact, a, an opportunity that has not come to them in nearly 100 years, to be precise, not since 1928. In other words, they have not since 1928 had the White House, Congress, the Senate, and the opportunity not just to place at least one, if not two or three judges in the Supreme Court and perhaps 10 or more in the federal courts. And so far, that and the prospect of healthcare reform, tax reform, infrastructure bills, I think has stopped them from assessing the full damage that this presidency might do to the party itself, or at least to its reputation. And so, um, and I don't think that that assessment is in any way mitigated by the fact that the special counsel has now been appointed. He was appointed by the Department of Justice. He's a former head of the FBI, and he's known to be um, a very a stickler for process, very thorough. I mean, the, in, in, the, in the good and, 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 and the, best, uh, the, in the, the best and the worst way, uh, this is likely to take years. And I don't see any incentive for the Republicans to change anything about this situation before the midterms. So I think this is something that we're dealing with for quite a while. And it won't have escaped anyone's notice here that the Democrats themselves are not particularly organized. They have, in fact, I think, not managed to resolve, the po the, to enter the post-Hillary era. There is a, obviously a bit of a tragedy attached to that but there is no visible leadership in the Democratic Party right now, as far as I can see. So, that is a somewhat darker scenario than the first one. The normal is over score also, of course, emphasizes the tectonic shifts that I was alluding to earlier. The changes in our politics, the changes in our societies, the um, the worsening of the situation of the American middle class, the polarization of American politics, the dramatic impending changes to the labor market because of technical change, technological change, particularly automation, that have not been factored into trade and, um, and economic policy at all so far. And of course, also, and I think most worryingly, a growing questioning of the norms and institutions of representative democracy and liberal order, and of America's guardianship of the international order itself. All of that has, th these are shifts that are, I think, profound, and that, I mean, there's always been elements of American thinking in, you know, that went in that direction, but it's never been quite this out in the open, and not, not shared this broadly. <coughs> 
The other thing that concerns Europeans and that concerns me about these, the ideologues that I just mentioned is that they are, while they're not strong on strategy, it's and certainly not strong on policy. And in fact, they have chosen to not appoint, or to not fill the positions, the policy making and writing positions in many of the departments that are supposed to do that, whether it's the Defense Department, um, the, uh, the State Department, or the NSC itself. They have very clearly defined attitudes. And I think if those of us who are policy wonks tend to look for papers, we tend to look for strategies and policies. We tend to discount attitudes because they seem to be so intangible. But I would suggest that with this group of people, it is essential that we look at them and essential that we understand that in the narratives, in their narratives, which I would describe as a triple war narrative, a culture war narrative, trade war narrative, and a war narrative, and in all of them, war is necessary, good, and cleansing in ways that, frankly, for a German, are somewhat reminiscent of uh, pre-World War I political literature of a certain kind, Oswald Spengler and others. And in all of these narratives, the EU is seen as a hostile actor that is inimical to American interest. I can point you to the actual text. Um, and even more worryingly for a German, particularly a, a, a pro-European, Europhile German like me, uh, Germany is seen as the, the sort of the spider in the web that is using, a, is using the EU as a front for its own nefarious machinations on currency, trade, refugees, and other things. It's trying to get its own way through the EU. Now, we all know, and I would be the first to admit this, that there are elements to these criticisms that, that are valid, and I'm happy to go into, great, uh, into detail on them in Q&A. But the problem with this, with, the, with the, the worldview espoused by the ideologues in the Trump administration is that their critique goes far, far beyond what is reasonable. And in fact, in the way that it's elaborated in the writings of some of them, or in the interviews, stuff they've said, it's frankly useless both as a theory or as a critique of state practice. It's just, I mean, it, it, it describes a world that I don't recognize and, um, of course, in politics, you can always argue, but in economics, you actually can't. Economics is about facts. And Germany does not control the ECB. In fact, Germany tried to get the ECB not to do quantitative easing. And to suggest that we're behind that policy is factually wrong. That's not going to stop Mr. Navarro from s asserting the contrary. But that is where we are. That is, that is then genuinely, we are then genuinely dealing with alternative facts. Now, the, let me, let me ad address sort of one sort of fundamental point about this that I think is important to not, to not miss. Um, and it's why I, I harped so much earlier on uh, the importance of a certain understanding of the benefits and risks of globalization in the sort of pre-Trump dispensation and particularly in the thinking of both Obama and Merkel. And that is this administration's attitude to globalization, which tellingly it calls globalism, as though this were an ideology yeah, or um, you know, an, an, an attitude that could be changed, a worldview that could be, if you decided to not be in denial or to correct your views, to not have what the Germans call falsches Bewusstsein, those are the Marxists, wrong consciousness, false consciousness, I think is the English translation, um, that you could correct. Interestingly, this kind of idea of false consciousness is also very popular in the Kremlin. The um, leaders of the Kremlin also think that we just don't understand the world as it is. We're not willing to understand that uh, great powers are what they are and great powers are destined to rule small powers. In fact, that small powers ought to fall in line. And that, I think, is... I think that, that is fundamentally the deepest divide that there is between the ideologues in the White House and most continental Europeans. This attitude to mutual integration, social, economic, legal, and political. The rejection by the Steve Bannons and Millers and Michael Antons, and the rejection of, as something that is fundamentally inimical to American views. 
That, I think, really pits us against each other because that's the open against the closed society. That's the connected world against the, the world which draws up its drawbridge, which pulls up its drawbridges. And that is what I am most concerned about because I think that genuinely is it, that, that is a divide so profound that I, I find it hard to overcome. Now, where do I think we are in reactions? Um, I think that it's because, as I said, because diplomats and policymakers tend to look for strategies and policymakers and for policy papers. I think we're still in an état d'attente, in a state of waiting. We have papers written by people before they joined the White House. We have tweets. We have course corrections, reversals, and then re-reversals. Um, I don't know whether you saw this morning, there was a Reuters story about a White House official, unnamed, who said um, that America might leave NATO if it didn't correct far, 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 far more quickly than, than it is, do, is doing now. I mean, that's obviously said ahead of the, the summit, the NATO summit, the end of the month. But um, that's a, that, if that's not a reversal of a re reversal, I don't know what is. And so the, the sense, I think, in the capitals, the way I've, I've seen it is that European diplomats are trying to combine hugging and hedging. In other words, trying to engage the Trump administration where they can. For the Germans, that has meant meeting not just with the father, but with the daughter, and inviting her to Berlin for a panel with Madame Lagarde and the Chancellor and the Queen of the Netherlands. Um, that has meant you know, trying to make a better case for why Germany is, for what kind of defense spending we're doing, how we're doing it, how we're changing the armed forces. But at the same time, I am quite certain that people are thinking about how they would have to hedge should the need arise. Now, to some degree, I think it's important to understand, and to those of you who study these things, it's, um, this, I'm not going to say anything new, is that some of the things that we might be engaging or that we might be hedging on have already begun. And that's particularly, that, that's rethinking European integration Rethinking European integration as a way not to construct some sort of a, an alien or sort of counter structure to NATO or to the West, but to reduce the vulnerabilities of Europe, to, to improve its resilience because we can't pull up the drawbridges, that's just, not, that's just not possible in Europe. And in particular, by finding more ways of cooperating on security and defense. And these Impulses are much older than, than Donald Trump. I think they were, they may have begun during the Iraq war, but I think the real impulse was Russian aggression. In Georgia, Crimea, Ukraine, but in particular, Russian meddling in the form of hybrid warfare, furthering corruption, funding right-wing political parties, you name it, the whole spectrum, within the European project and in the Balkans. That, if you, want to, if you want to upset the Germans, if you want to get the Germans very, very worried, then, then you attack the European project itself. And so in Berlin, it has been at least two or three years now that Russia has stopped to be seen as a strategic partner. In fact, that term is no longer used. Um, and I think it's seen more of, more, as more of a challenger a spoiler, and perhaps in some ways even as an adversary. Now, I mentioned the Iraq war. Obama's pivot to Asia had also had some effect in uh, galvanizing Europeans to think more about autonomous, but not independent, and not independent of NATO capabilities. Um, I flippantly described this as using NATO as the framework for European security and defense with a guest room for the Americans. Um, I think that is what it increasingly might look like, at least for small and, and medium-sized operations. I mean, obviously, in the case of outright war, which I don't expect, we wouldn't be able to survive without the Americans. But I do also think that the Americans have a perfectly legitimate case when they say you ought to be able to do more on your own. And we expect you to do that because we will be needing our assets. Um, somewhere else, or because our Congress or our public feel that you ought to do this. All of that, I think, is entirely legitimate, 
And as far as I'm concerned, we ought to have been doing that ages ago. But what I'm describing now, this atmosphere of vol volatility, unpredictability, and for the first time since the end of World War II, hostility towards the European project, and Germany in particular, is reinforcing these tendencies. So you might say, from an American vantage point, that a lot of this hedging might actually be good, because it's in, in the American interest that we make ourselves more self-sufficient and less vulnerable and more resilient. What I worry about is that this might drive a permanent wedge in the relationship, which I would greatly regret. I'm, I've lived in America now for, I'm living there for the, first, the, third, the third time in my life. I uh, have a deep affection for the country. And I have enormous admiration for its achievements, not least for its constitution. And I would like to see America prosper, and I would like to see the transatlantic relationship prosper. But I do think that we are at an inflection point where um, we are in sort of really at risk of, of the relationship taking a very permanent downturn. Let me just to, to, to end briefly say something about Germany. Um, it's Germany's role in all this has been much discussed. You will all remember the Economist cover describing Germany as the reluctant hegemon. I think that both those terms are wrong. One, because Germany is no longer reluctant. Um, I think that for the past four or five years, there has been a very intense and very constructive and very energetic debate in Germany about how to adopt uh, a much more forward-leaning foreign policy and security posture. The reorganization of the foreign ministry, the defense ministry white book of last year are all part of that. Um, you may have heard of the three speeches in Munich at the Munich Security Conference in 2014, where the German president and the foreign minister and the defense minister all said we need to exercise more responsibility because we have so much more power. All of that is true. But the, what's, what, so I think the reluctance is, is more or less gone, and the Russians have certainly helped. But what I think is, is more problematic is the notion of, the he of, of, of hegemonic power. We may have power, but it's not hegemony for the simple reason that it is very easy for other European countries to block. It is also very easy for other European countries to, to thwart yeah, or just to undermine whatever Germany thinks it's doing um, by, by not playing along. And I would, I would say Germany has brought this upon itself in, on a number of cases through its own Either, either the substance or the style of its foreign policy decisions. But even leaving that aside, I think it is simply not possible, and that is where American assessments of German leadership in Europe are often misguided, it is not possible for any country to run Europe in the way that the Americans have for so many decades been the first among equals within NATO, where America's word counted for more than, uh, for far more than, than, than that of other nations. I think if we do not manage among ourselves to, to overcome the, extra, the, the deep divisions that now exist in Europe on economics and on security between the South and the North and between the South and the, and the East, then we will, I think, see very little German effective leadership. And in fact, we will see a Europe that is fundamentally diminished. I do think that the elections in Europe, the Dutch, um, the French, and possibly the way it looks now, the, the German elections, may provide for a sort of new jumpstart for the European Union because they will provide for more cohesion. But I think that can only be the beginning of what needs to be a much larger and much more energetic conversation and one that I very much hope is not going to leave out the Americans, and I'll stop there.